Black Panther is an international sensation. If you are a Marvel fan, then you've definitely watched it when the movie came out. The truth is, back then, I didn't know what to expect. Would it be trash and feel redundant? Is it really worth the hype? For me, the movie was totally worth it. But it wasn't the superhero theme that made it memorable. It was how it portrayed Africa and African culture. It didn't show us the classic Hollywood stereotype of poverty, misery, and violence. Instead, it showed us a vision and world building of a futuristic African culture. I have literally never seen anything like it. That's exactly what I want to talk about in this video. So let's jump right in. Let's face it, there is a huge difference between how Africa is portrayed in movies and how it really is. Most of the time, we see this continent as being dangerous and mysterious, usually with limited ties to modern civilization. While in reality, the skyline of most African cities is nothing short of tall buildings, skyscrapers, and stunning architecture. Black Panther takes this stereotype, breaks it into a million pieces, and gives us a completely different perspective of African culture. The movie starts with narration. A man tells his son the history of their people. Centuries ago, a meteor that contained vibranium, the most powerful metal in the universe, crash landed in Africa. The five African tribes were constantly at war with one another. They all wanted possession of this strong metal. That's until the panther goddess, Bast, spoke to one warrior, Shaman, and gave him an herb. This herb was a gateway to superhuman strength, speed, and instinct. The man became the first black panther, the protector of Wakanda. A warrior shaman received a vision from the panther goddess Bast, who led him to the heart-shaped herb, a plant that granted him superhuman strength. The Black Panther united Wakanda, but one of the tribes, the Jabari, wasn't that keen on agreeing to live under the king. Instead, they decided to distance themselves and live separately from the other tribes. Thanks to Vibranium, the kingdom of Wakanda grew to become a technological marvel. As the years passed, the Wakandans used this special metal to build and improve. But as Wakanda developed, the rest of the nations were at war. To protect its people and the metal from the broken world, Wakanda used a cloaking field to hide in plain sight. The scene jumps to 1992, Oakland. Children are playing basketball, while in one of the buildings nearby, Prince Njobu is discussing some strategies while working as an undercover spy with his partner Zuri. Then comes a knock at the door. Zuri asks if these are the feds, but upon closer inspection, he sees two women dressed in tribal clothing holding spears. Ngabani. Prince Njobu, son of Azuri. This is where we get the first glimpse of the Wakandans. King T'Chaka comes to visit his brother Njobu and uses a device attached to his wrist, showcasing a man who stole vibranium and activated a bomb at the border to escape, claiming that this was an inside job. The king accuses Njobu of conspiring with the arms dealer, Ulysses Claw, to steal the metal and attack the Wakandan people. Zuri reveals himself as another spy and confirms the king's suspicions. In the present day, T'Challa, King T'Chaka's son, is to be crowned king, together with the leader of the Dora Milaje Royal Guard. They extract Nakia, T'Challa's ex, so that she will join him for his coronation ceremony. This is where we first see the height of the Wakandan civilization. This fictional country is truly breathtaking. It borrows aspects of cultures from around Africa and presents them in a way that catches the uniqueness and beauty of African culture. I love the vision of a technologically advanced utopia that also celebrates and embraces African culture through costume, tradition, language, and ritual. This is a lot better than how other movies portray Africa, savage, chaotic, and poor. I like how the movie represents and reimagines African communities and points out the importance of religion, mysticism, and tradition. The movie's futuristic vision is not absorbed by common modernity. Rather, it appears alongside a culturally rich array inspired by Africa's present and past. That's because Wakanda is a blend of different African ethnic groups. We can see this from the indigenous symbols and outfits, like the grass skirts, lip plates, cowry shells adornments, and decorative scarring. I want to talk about this in depth. Despite having high-tech devices, massive buildings, and flying spaceships, the people still respect their culture and traditions. For example, oral tradition can be seen in the opening scene where the child wants to hear the story of home, which is the origins of Wakanda. 
These cosmological experiences and beliefs are clearly important to the people of Wakanda. Other than the symbolic elements and mysticism, we see that respect for culture and tradition is showcased in the clothes and accessories people wear. Black Panther is a fashion film as much as it is a superhero film, but this is the type of fashion that reflects a story, which blends perfectly with the African culture. I want to start with the grass skirts. When the Jabari challenge the future king, they enter the scene wearing grass skirts. As simple as they may be, there is a whole story behind these skirts. The Basotho people, native to South Africa, traditionally wore grass skirts. This garment was made of plant fibers, such as leaves and grasses. The Basotho people had different ways of dressing, depending on the occasion, age, and individual. After coming of age, the Basotho would make a skirt of woven fiber. They were also known for their headgear. Most of the headpieces were made out of leaves and straw, while some were made from animal skins. Those crafted from animal skin were traditionally worn by warriors. The Jabari in this scene are wearing headpieces that, in some way, look like they are made of animal skin. But there's also this intricate detailing that makes it unique and fearsome. Then we see the lip plates. Different African tribes indulge in body modification, like using lip plates, also known as lip discs, or plugs. The women of the Mercy tribe, for example, wear lip plates to symbolize maturity. The plates reflect pride and beauty. If a man wants to marry a woman, he would have to pay her father's cattle. The bigger the lip plate, the more cattle it will cost. The women know how much their husbands paid and wear the lip plate when serving him food during ceremonies or celebrations. But most of the time, a woman is promised to marry before she starts the lip plating process. So the dowry is agreed upon beforehand. This makes the lip plate a symbolic part of the tribe's identity and culture. That's why these plates are often decorated with paint and intricate patterns. Now in this movie scene, we see a man wearing a lip plate. In the native Amazonian tribe, young boys often have their lips pierced and start wearing lip plates when they become men. In this tribe, the lip plates are measured by their singing and oratory skills. The biggest plates are worn by the best war chiefs and orators, like Chief Rayoni of the Kayapo tribe. Cowrie shell adornments are also worn throughout the movie. We can first see them in the scene where T'Challa's mother and sister wait for his arrival. His sister is wearing these shells in the form of a choker. During the coronation ceremony, other people are also wearing them. Cowrie shells have many uses and meanings. In many cultures, cowrie shells were used as money. Countless museums show exhibits of the humble beginnings of trade. And in West Africa, cowrie shells were the first unofficial currency. They were traded for goods and services throughout Oceania, Europe, Asia, and Africa and used as money sometime in the 14th century. Because these shells were compact, sturdy, and easy to carry, they served as an excellent form of currency. Plus, they were all unique, meaning they were impossible to counterfeit. It is said that King Gezo of Dahomey, present-day Republic of Benin, preferred cowrie shells more than gold. But these shells were more than just money. They were also a popular form of jewelry and religious accessories. Spiritually, if cowrie shells were to hold a special place in your heart, it was said that you are family to the ocean spirit of earth and wealth. These adornments symbolize prosperity and destiny and represent the goddess of protection in the ocean. I like how the movie takes the shells a step further and adds them to casual clothing, which we can see in Wakanda. Fashion is quite modern and appealing. During the ceremony, M'Baku, the leader of the Jabari tribe, and T'Challa engage in ritual combat. T'Challa wins and becomes the new king. Despite challenging his throne, T'Challa lets M'Baku live. After the battle, T'Challa receives another drink and is taken into the ancestral plane. We can see him wearing traditional clothing. This stage of the ritual looks quite like a burial. In this limited period, T'Challa is neither dead nor alive, but can commune with his father. We see him reliving the moment when his father was murdered, which is etched deep into his mind. He grieves his loss until he is taken to the tree and greeted by many Black Panthers. These are the previous wielders of the power of the heart-shaped herb. His father comes to greet T'Challa. The two converse, and his father says that T'Challa is a good man with a good heart, and it's hard for a good man to be king. Later, we see T'Challa talking with the leaders of the other tribes. Many of the Wakandians, including Wakabi, the head of security for Wakanda's border tribe, are wearing decorative scarring. Scarification in Africa is a major aspect of African cultures among different ethnic groups. In the past, scarification was used to create marks on the skin that would distinguish a man or a woman from anyone else. It could tell their rank in the clan, society, tribe, and family. It could symbolize their strength or beauty. In many African tribes, 
Wearing scars was like an identity card on your face. It was both a cultural and aesthetic component. Even in some cases, it could be used as protection against evil spirits. The movie makes scarification very visible and relevant to Wakanda society. Elements of a black nationalist philosophy can be seen in the movie, especially in the way people view Wakanda and their African homeland. We can see this in the market scene. We could provide aid and access to technology and refuge to those who need it. Other countries do it, we could do it better. This is a utopia for black people. Its resources are not depleted and its sense of tradition and culture is strong. There is food in abundance. People are walking on dirt roads and using high-tech devices. Everyone shops and walks with a smile. It is the perfect contrast to the Western world. Although Wakanda doesn't directly support black people outside its borders, the society works in harmony and hopes to bring peace to as many people near its borders as possible. Another way Wakanda shatters African stereotypes is by showing women in power. African women in Wakanda are an important pillar of society. Princess Shuri is in charge of technological advancements. The mining tribe elder and the merchant tribe elder are female leaders. The head of the Wakandan armed forces is a female and the fighters she is leading are women. There are male fighters as well, particularly those fighting for the border tribe. Yet, this shows that women in Wakanda can reach new heights in battle, technology, science, and engineering. Compared to other Hollywood movies, Black Panther doesn't put black characters in the background, like some sassy sidekicks. In Wakanda, they are in control of their own destiny and are not dehumanized or portrayed in a negative way. This is why I think Black Panther resonates with a lot of culturally diverse people around the world. As the movie goes on, we can see it adds more value. In London, a gang led by a former American black ops soldier, Eric Stevens, aka Killmonger, and Claw steal an axe from a museum. This axe is no ordinary weapon. It is an ancient tool made of Wakandan vibranium. As soon as Wakanda receives word of the weapon, they find exactly where Claw is. So, the mission is to capture Claw in South Korea and bring him to justice in Wakanda. T'Challa, with Nakia and Okoye, go to an underground casino in Busan, where they are planning to meet the buyer interested in the axe. But the plan goes wrong when the king of Wakanda realizes that the buyer is Everett Ross, a CIA agent. Fight breaks out, and the car chase follows. Claw is apprehended. While in custody, Killmonger saves Claw, but Ross is gravely injured since he took a bullet for Nakia. The king decides to take Ross to Wakanda to heal his spine and save Ross's life. It turns out that Killmonger's plan was to kill Claw and take his body to Wakanda in the form of a token. Here, it is revealed that Killmonger is the son of N'Jobu and has the right to challenge T'Challa for the throne. T'Challa accepts his challenge and the two engage in ritual combat. Here is another example of skin scarring. Eric Killmonger's unmatched skills as an assassin earned him a chest full of scars. These are tribal marks called crocodile scarring and are used to represent every life he took by showing these scars. We can see that Eric is a character obsessed with punishing his oppressors through the same kind of violence that's been used against him. Killmonger defeats T'Challa and throws him over a waterfall. After ingesting the herb and gaining the powers of the Black Panther, Killmonger does exactly what he promised. He enacts his father's plan and decides to distribute Wakandan vibranium and weapons to Wakandan operatives around the world. He believes that the people of the world must be led to the right way, the Wakandan way, and the vibranium can give him that power. Nakia manages to save one of the heart-shaped herbs before Killmonger burns them all. She then, together with Ross, Shuri, and Ramonda, flee to seek refuge in the Jabari tribe. Here, they find Chachala. The Jabari had stumbled across their king in the river and transported him back to the village. With the help of the herb, T'Challa is brought back from the comatose state and healed. The leader of the Jabari tribe saved T'Challa because he owed him a great debt, a life for a life. Healed and back into his Black Panther suit, T'Challa returns to settle the score. But Killmonger refuses another trial by combat and orders his warriors to fight the former king. This is when we see the biggest divide. The border tribe allies with the new king, while Okoye and the Dora Milaje fight for T'Challa. In the meantime, Ross is piloting a remote jet to take down the airships transporting vibranium weapons outside the country. T'Challa is losing the battle until Jabari finally decides to join him and turn the tide. Killmonger and T'Challa fall into the vibranium mine where the battle continues. T'Challa manages to land a fatal blow to Killmonger and this is where we see Killmonger actually showing his feelings and desire to see the sunset, a fairy tale he chased as a kid. T'Challa decides to honor his request and takes Killmonger to see the sunset. During this moment, T'Challa offers to heal Killmonger and give him another chance to live. But Killmonger refuses, claiming that he would rather choose death than a life in bondage. 
Killmonger removes the blade from his chest, which quickly stops his heart. T'Challa gets on the throne. The Jabari tribe receives a seat on the council and finally gets the chance to voice their opinions. This is the first time the Jabari are recognized for their loyalty after the formation of the Kingdom of Wakanda. T'Challa decides that Wakanda will no longer live in isolation. It will change the way the previous kings ruled before him. He decides to establish an embassy in the United States, run by Shuri and Nakia. T'Challa then addresses the United Nations and reveals the true power and potential that his kingdom offers. This movie depicts the courage, genius, ingenuity, compassion, and beauty of Africans and African culture. It challenges many modern stereotypes about Africa and counters media distortions. To me, Wakanda is a place that answers the question, what would have happened to the African continent if it were never colonized? If you enjoyed this, the video on the screen is another interesting story that I'm sure you'd love to hear. Click on it now to watch. We'll see you over there.